The sage of Omaha once said, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. But what do you do when investors are a little bit of both? Well, thankfully, I know some very smart people who can help you with that question. I'm Scott Armstrong. I am the editor-in-chief of Arabian Business. And sadly, I'm not fearful about being greedy. But please let me welcome you to this, the Emirates MBD CIO Office Global Investment Outlook 2022. Now, after a 2021 that didn't quite hit the heights that some had hoped for, 2022 is off to a searing start. With cryptos crashing and even the big techs taking a punch, those poor, poor billionaires. But what does that mean for investors? Well, thankfully, to get us off to an energetic start, I'm joined by Emirates MBD's Chief Investment Officer, a man for whom capital preservation is an obsession and who says he's structurally in love with emerging markets. Boy, those markets don't know how lucky they are. Maurice Gravier, the floor is yours. Hello and welcome to our 2022 Global Investment Outlook, hopefully the last one in virtual format. My colleagues and I are delighted to share our views. I will start with the key characteristics of the year before we go into more details on equity, fixed income, the economic outlook and the longer term picture. To start with, as always, before the year ahead, the year behind. This is what we said in 2021. We were expecting a modestly positive year. Our theme of magic money was a clear pro-cyclical roadbook, much better for stocks than for bonds. Finally, we liked again emerging markets. Six months later, we made a mid-year update to our outlook with only one message. Because of the virus and of central banks, we were expecting much sharper volatility in the second part of the year. So what happened in 2021? Well, we got actually the positive but modest returns of plus two, four and eight percent for the year. That was right. It was also right to prefer stocks over bonds. Actually, stocks from developed markets, as well as listed real estate from developed markets, gained more than 20% in 2021, while, as you can see, all defensive assets were in the red. So it was right. What wasn't right was our call on emerging market stocks. They materially underperformed because of China, and I'll come back to that. What did we change? Frankly, not much. Again, this magic money story was quite constant, so we were overweight stocks and underweight bonds all year long with only minor technical adjustments. The real changes came in January 2022, because 2022 is different. There is no visibility anymore. Under the sun of economic recovery, the magic liquidity is evaporating and turns into fog for investors. These clouds are big open questions that will have to find answers in 2022, and I will take you through five of them. Let's start with COVID, of course. We are still very much in a pandemic. Actually, as you can see on the left, the number of daily global new cases has never been as high. So, is Omicron the last variant? Will the virus be fully eradicated? Our assumption is probably not. What does it mean for investment? Well, of course, it means risk and elevated volatility, especially if the next variant is even more dangerous than Omicron. Having said that, there is a positive. Despite the raging number of infections, global economy has remained open. We have learned to live with the virus and we believe it will continue. We believe in resilience. Second question, of course, inflation. Consumer and factory prices have risen at paces unseen since the 80s. So are we entering a spiral of rising prices wages, interest rates? We don't think so. First, we look at the key reason behind the current inflation. People were stuck. They had money that they couldn't spend on services because they were closed. So people bought goods at a time when factories and logistics were also struggling. Demand 
will remain high with hard earned money replacing magic money. Employment is improving, so demand will remain elevated. However, it will be rebalanced towards more services and less goods. The issues in the supply chain have already started to be fixed. On top of that, we have more favorable base effects which will be at play, and so we believe that inflation will gradually abate to better levels. You have noticed that I didn't even mention central banks. Yes, they are fighting inflation. However, it's interesting to remember that for years, they failed to stimulate inflation with quantitative easing and interest rates at zero. So why would it work the other way? I'm not sure. The Fed hiking interest rates will probably not restart a semiconductor factory in Taiwan. However, if we can question the fact that central banks control inflation, what is unquestionable is that they have a huge impact on markets. Their shift, their agenda, their trajectory will sustain volatility everywhere, starting with interest rates. Indeed, should market participants be scared of a hyperinflation scenario or even of just a policy miscalculation, interest rates would overshoot. You know what? If they overshoot, we will buy bonds. Third question, China. Mr. Xi is probably president for life. He aims at building a modern socialist country. One of the two worlds sounds more market friendly than the other. And indeed, between an intense regulatory crackdown on the private sector and, of course, critical debt situation in the real estate, Chinese markets have suffered, really suffered last year. So is a modern socialist country investable? Our answer is yes, but selectively and opportunistically. Our view on the Chinese leadership is that China wants to have all the attributes of a global superpower. It requires economic prosperity, but it also includes strong, trusted, powerful financial markets. For prosperity, they will stimulate growth. For markets, we believe that their priorities are the currency and the bond markets. For stocks, it's complicated because stocks are an icon of the inequalities that they are trying to fight. So, bottom line, what do we think? Bonds, quality bonds are investable and we increasingly look at one even in local currency. When it comes to stock, quality stocks are probably the best candidate to be accumulated on weakness. Talking about weakness, after years and years and years and years of outperformance, the technology sector is suffering so far in 2022. Of course, they have fantastic business models, but they are facing challenges, rising interest rates, more stringent regulation, or simply their size and the base effect that they have. So will their domination on markets continue? Frankly, it's a difficult one. First, don't get me wrong, innovation is the best single driver of growth because it creates its own demand independently from all the rest. However, you can find it elsewhere, especially in healthcare, probably at better prices. The tech sector is vulnerable because it is priced for perfection, widely owned, and again, facing challenges. We believe that there will be more volatility and that, very importantly, only the true winners will be rewarded by markets. From technology to crypto assets, it's an easy one, but crypto assets are also a big question for 2022 because they have become big. Are crypto the future or a disaster waiting to happen? Well, we believe they are both. On the disaster side, all signs of a speculative bubbles are here, including stunning prices. What we have put on this slide on the left is a collection of non-fungible tokens called the Bored Apes. This computer-generated 10,000 pictures of monkeys sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Their total value is in the range of 3 billion US dollars, which is probably more than the world's most valued painting, Mona Lisa. Of course, 
in a way, you could think, okay, if people can spend millions on a custom car plate, why not doing the same on a kind of a digital social status symbol? Of course, as well, NFTs are more than just pictures, but still, prices are impressive. Actually, out of the 200,000 plus digital tokens currently living on various chains, we believe that a vast majority is worth zero. Don't get me wrong, the blockchain technology and the Web3 are genuine revolutions with the potential to create immense value in the future. However, from an investment perspective, it is still a jungle of speculation and undiscriminated valuation. It's very difficult to pick the winners and to get them at a fair price. As you know, we do not advise on crypto assets yet, one day we will, but of course, they are not disconnected from the rest. Technically, if we had a crash over there, it would trigger profit-taking elsewhere, and it's another reason to sustain volatility. Fundamentally, the highly decentralized Web3 will challenge internet giants. So, there are big questions, visibility is low, this is why in 2022, we will have to adapt to whatever appears week after week after week, rather than trying to guess what lies ahead in the fog. It's reactivity this time over proactivity. And let me take you through the key market drivers for the year ahead. We are not outright bearish for one reason. The backdrop is supportive. Growth is strong, inflation should abate, and this should mitigate or maybe even offset the adverse impact from less policy support. Valuations are expensive. It has two consequences. First, the upside potential is limited, and second, there is vulnerability to anxiety, and as we just saw, there is no shortage of triggers for anxiety. Of course, sentiment is less bullish after this volatile January, but positioning remains heavy. Last year alone, equity funds collected almost a trillion US dollars. Let's look at a bit more details. First, the economic growth. What you can see on the screen is the just updated IMF forecast for the year. So the global GDP should grow in real terms by 4.4%. It is less than 2021, but importantly, it is more than the long-term trend, which means that this level of growth generates jobs which sustain growth. It's a kind of escape velocity, and well, central banks are right to calm down on magic money. And it's a good news. Inflation, is it all bad? Not necessarily, because inflation helps mitigate the debt burden. That's a good news. And for companies who are able to preserve their margins, inflation means double-digit returns ahead. Talking about inflation and central banks, yes, of course, we see an extraordinary, extraordinary level of tightening. But the reason is that we had an extraordinary level of support before. And as you can see on the left, the central bank balance sheet, magic money is still around in tons in the system. Looking at the right, inflation in orange, these are the real numbers and the forecast. We are not alone to think that it should abate. The blue line is policy rates in the US. Yes, they will rise, but still modestly. Can the global recovery survive with interest rates 1% higher? Of course it can. The issue is not in the backdrop again, it is in the vulnerability from valuations. On the left, the blue line is the price earning ratio for developed market stocks. And as you can see, historically, it is high. When you compare it with interest rates, the picture is different. The orange area is the excess performance you can expect from stocks over bonds. And this is not crazily low. It means that the valuation of stocks is okay if you compare it to interest rates. Of course, it means that if interest rates rise, equity multiples should compress further. It also sustains volatility and it also poses questions on the benefits of diversification. If there is a crash in bond, there will be a crash in equity. On the right uh, side, you can see that emerging markets, the orange line, PE multiple, are much more reasonable in absolute, historically, and compared to developed markets. Their discount is the blue area on the bottom. It's quite high, historically. We expect, we are sure, actually, that 
these valuations should converge over the long term, but probably not in a straight line with China being the big question. Behavioral factor, again, as, you, as we discussed already, there is no shortage of concerns to worry about, and it could trigger profit taking, especially especially as investors are sitting on huge unrealized profits. What you can see on the right is the market returns from the 12th of March 2020, and they are very impressive. So that's why, put all together, we expect another year of positive but modest returns, and importantly, with lots of volatility and an erratic trajectory. Normal fundamental returns, maybe plus 2 to plus 6% for our profiles if everything goes well, with abnormally high volatility. In other terms, it's a poor risk-adjusted return that we expect. The silver lining, there is one to any cloud, even a dense fog, is the fact that we will have tactical opportunities to do better. So let me illustrate this by a scenario and probability view. Our central scenario, the one I just presented to you, we allocate a 60% probability. Risk are skewed to the downside. The very scenario, we put a 30% probability, in which case our performance will be negative, but we would very certainly outperform our competitors, and we only put a 10% probability to be too conservative and that market's ready. We don't think it will happen. Last year, we would have put an 80% probability to our central scenario and 10% for each other because it was a year of visibility and confidence. This year, it's not the case. So, how do we start the year? Our positioning is different. We have what we have kept is the underweight in the most defensive segments of fixed income because we expect turbulence over there. But again, we would love to buy them back and secure comfortable, safe yields for the future. In January, we have cut our allocation to develop market equities from a large overweight to just neutral now. But again, we would consider any material correction as a potential opportunity to add to risk. We are slightly, only slightly overweight on emerging market stocks. Yes, their valuation is better, but it comes at the price of, of course, elevated risk. To be able to seize these opportunities, we hold a large amount of cash, as you can see, and we are also overweight on hedge funds, which should do well in a less directional environment. Again, this is the starting point, and probably this year more than in the previous ones, we will change it. As always, let me conclude with, in full transparency, our performance compared to our global competition. As you know, our aim is to protect your capital better in difficult times, but be in line or slightly, only slightly below when markets ready. In the difficult 2018, we outperformed our competition. That was the deal. In the very good 2019, we were in line with them. By the way, we are in blue on the chart and they are in orange, as you would have guessed. 2020 was the perfect year because we did both. We were defensive during the crash and fully invested after that. So we killed the competition. We were very proud. And then humility came back in 2021. We lagged our competition. Yes, our returns were positive, 2, 4, and 8% in right numbers. But we were below our competitors for two reasons. First, our portfolio construction uh, aims at protecting capital over three five and seven years. Our competitors don't, but it requires more defensive assets. And as you remember, it was a terrible year for defensive assets. Second, we have a stronger long-term conviction on emerging markets than them, and emerging markets were detrimental last year. Of course, we are very confident that our approach is right, otherwise we would change it, and we are confident that it is right to deliver steady, superior returns over the long term. With that, thank you very much, and over to you, Scott. Thank you, Maurice. Insightful as always. Now remember, Maurice will be back later for the live Q&A with the entire CIO team. So if you have a question for them, please submit it in the live chat box. Now, next up, a lady who I will never play chess with because I do not like humiliation. The inscrutable Anita Gupta, Emirates MBD's Head of Equity Strategies, who will be taking her look at what 2022 could mean for the equity markets. Anita, it's your move. Thank you, Scott, for that affirmation. 
where are equity markets headed? I'm going to discuss today which factors, sectors and regions are best positioned as we face the headwinds of inflation and rising rates and the positive tailwinds of still above trend economic growth and corporate profitability. Equity markets have had exponential returns over the last three years. Global equities are up 77%, US equities 100%, and growth sectors such as technology double that. However, this January has been one of the most volatile on record. The backdrop has changed. The blue line in front of you depicts the performance of the MSCI World Growth Index, the yellow line, the MSCI Value Index. Growth has led performance for the last three years. However, in January, this changed and value took over. Technology, which has been the top performing sector, was knocked off its top spot. And what has happened? We have a different backdrop. What's the outlook for technology? COVID winners, Peloton, Teladoc, uh, Zoom are today almost back at pre-pandemic prices. Who are going to be the winners? Companies with resilient margins. Our positioning and what's happened in 21. Regionally, we saw developed market equities lead with the US and Europe at an almost upward uninterrupted trajectory. Emerging markets lagged with China's underperformance. However, India and the GCC were among the top performing regions globally. On sector performance, it was a mix of cyclical and growth. Energy led as mobility indicators improved as economies reopened, followed by technology and then financials. Our market health checklist lists out the factors which would direct equity performance in 2022. We no longer have record stimulus, which led to record demand and uh, record growth. Technology regulations are changing everywhere, especially in China. We are now in a monetary tightening cycle. However, let's keep in mind, though history doesn't repeat itself, in the last 11 out of 12 tightening cycles, the S&P 500 actually rose with an average annualized performance of 9%. What worries us? Wage pressures, inflation, supply chain disruption, a shortage of chips. Uh, in the US, the supply of chips is around five days. The service industry is yet to come back to pre-pandemic levels. However, all this is mitigated by still strong margins, still strong growth, and of course, the development of technologies, messenger RNA, which ensure that the vaccine rollout and economies opening continues. Inflows are strong. We saw almost a trillion dollars last year into equities, and this continues into this year. Our positioning, as Maurice said, we are neutral developed markets as we start the year. Valuations are higher. We look for better entry points. We have liked the US for a long time. We continue to like it. Uh, why are we underweight Europe? We see tensions emanating from uh, Russia and Ukraine. We could see a possible shortage of energy. Uh, emerging markets, we are more positive. Uh, domestic economies, uh, we favor India and the UAE. Uh, sectors and themes. Now, selectivity pays. Our developed market model portfolio has returned 140% over the last five years compared to developed market equities at 107%. Why? Because we focus on companies which have strong balance sheets and very strong businesses. Now, with this focus on margins, what are the sectors that we like? For cyclicals, we like financials, a beneficiary of higher yields. For growth, select technology sectors, and of course, with an aging population, healthcare remains important. For dividend yield, many energy companies today pay a dividend of over 5%. Overlaying all this is environmental, social, and governance. Let's come to our fair value estimates for the year end 2022. Looking at that yellow bar in front of you, we see upside across the eight major regions that we cover. We see a mid-digit upside for the US and Europe around 5%, 10% for Japan and the UK, higher for the emerging markets as we start with lower valuations in the mid-teens. Our 
fair value estimates are very simplistically based on a multiple of price to earnings and EPS growth. Estimates for 2022 for price to earning are lower as we are in a higher rate regime. EPS growth too is lower than 21 as we are coming off a very high base. With the sell-off in January, the gap to the fair values has increased. In the US, with our fair value index estimate at 49.50, we now have a 10% upside. So, how about the US? How about technology? What do we see? Maurice already spoke about the headwinds that technology is facing. We are seeing on US corporates an impact on margins in the fourth quarter earning calls. At least two-thirds of corporates spoke about the impact of higher wages. The US Labor Department estimates that wages grew by 4% year-on-year in December. We are seeing supply chain disruptions. We are seeing higher interest costs. However, if you look at the chart in front of you, 2022 sees a small impact on margins as many companies are able to pass on these higher costs to consumers. Uh, right from Starbucks to Caterpillar, companies have spoken about being able to pass on these costs. Interestingly, technology is the sector with the second highest margin and the FANGs, Microsoft, Amazon, Google have a margin which is 50% higher than the S&P 500. Some trends are here to stay, whether it is working from home, entertainment at home, uh, exercising at home. And that brings us to connectivity and the cloud. And revenues continue to grow at about 30 to 40% globally. And that's why these large technology companies are able to continue generating strong revenue and earnings growth. But it's not all the same. Watch out for competition. The Facebook share fell sharply as it gave over market share to TikTok. Now we come to our emerging market preferences. Firstly, the UAE. Very strong performance in 21, continued strong performance in 22. What's driving this performance? Of course, the real estate market, which has picked up. Uh, Khadija, our chief economist, will talk more about this. But most importantly, the IPO pipeline, capital issuance. We saw Abu Dhabi come out with three IPOs in 21, which had a 45% median uh, upside. Uh, we, which included uh, Yasat, uh, Adnog Drilling, and FertiGlobe. This year, we are seeing Dubai with 10 state entities expected to list. Possible on the chart could be Diva, Emirates Airlines, yet to announce. However, we do have Abu Dhabi, which is announced with Abu Dhabi Ports. You could also see many family-owned businesses in the UAE come to IPO, whether it is the al Thames or the uh, al -Gurez yet to see what actually comes. Now going on to India, a second preferred overweight within uh, the emerging market space. India again, strong performance in 21, continued strong performance in 22. And again, we are seeing driven by the new capital issuance, $17 billion in 21 new age IPOs, Nika, Zomato, Paytm, another $400 billion expected in the next three years. India, Highest growth economically, 9.5% expected for 22 fiscal year and another 8.5% in 23. What's not to like? Coming to China, why are we neutral? We have seen regulatory oversight over gaming, online education, listings in the US. The Golden Dragon China Index in front of you, that yellow line, has fallen 50%. In China, we say stay allocated as per the asset allocation grid. Focus on the domestic story where a great number of small and mid-cap new age companies are going to be very successful. Many themes continue to perform, whether it is semiconductors, US retail, while some themes have reversed directions such as genomics after a very strong 2020 performance. What remains important is connectivity across sectors, the use of big data and AI in every industry, preventative healthcare, a huge government focus, the US has a three 0.6% spend of GDP on healthcare, uh, environmental, social, and governance factors. And this brings us to the interaction of technology with every industry. The complementarity is what leads and supports equity performance across sectors. Today, technology complements every single sector and institution, whether it is on the social, the environment, or the political front. We cannot implement climate change initiatives or carbon emission reduction 
without technological adoption. Governments are focused on a path to net zero, and which is why electric vehicles are seeing a huge proliferation, a huge penetration with a longer battery life, better range and newer models. To conclude, focus on selectivity. We are going to continue to see volatility. However, we will be reactive and we should end the year positively. Thank you, Anita. Well played. And remember, there is more from Anita and the team later on in the live Q&A. So get those questions in and stay tuned because there's far more insights to come, including what the long term view has in store for us. Now, next up, it's Super Satyajit Singh, Emirates MBD's head of fixed income strategy, a man who's affectionately known at Raving Business as the Hulk and whose boss describes him as a man of conviction and transparency. So once again, Satyajit, it's time to smash. Thank you, Scott. As investment strategists, we are expected to predict the future, but sometimes it actually makes sense to take a pause, look back and apply the learnings before moving ahead. So what we are looking here is last 20 years history of Fed funds rate. You can see that there has been two key rate hike cycles. The first one in 2004, to 2006, where the rates increased by 425 bips, and the second one in 2016 to 2018, where the rates increased by 200 bips. Moreover, there has been one quantitative tightening cycle in 2017 to 2019. So, a recurring theme throughout this presentation will be, we'll be looking back at the history and then trying to apply our learnings to understand how different segments behave. As they say, history rhymes itself. So, starting with 10-year treasury yields, you can see how 10-year treasury yields have behaved during the last rate hike cycles, both in 2004, 2006, as well as 2016 to 2018. What is interesting is that in 2004, 2006, the rates, especially the 10-year treasury yields, increased by 50 bips before the actual rate hike, and then retraced almost all of it once the rate hike started. That was considered a conundrum. Will that repeat itself? That is the major question. Now, we think there is a high probability of that. Why? First of all, the supply of US Treasury will be lower this year compared to 2020 and 2021. But what is more important is that the demand from foreigners and real money players remains strong. Moreover, the flattened yield curve actually indicates that investors and the market is not convinced about long-term growth. That could put a lid on the 10-year Treasury yields. So remember that Fed is going to be fast and furious this time around. This is going to be a whole different kind of rate hike cycle. That means there will be a lot more low visibility about the yields and spreads. In fact, the double whammy of fixed income markets, which is increasing yields as well as spread widening should come into effect in 2022 and could affect MTM losses on client portfolios. So our advice is to diversify and get very selective on credit. Why diversify? Because you do not want to miss those corners of growth but also you need to be prepared with some safe haven asset classes in terms of market turbulence, which can cushion the blow to the portfolios. Now coming to our year-end predictions, we think 10-year treasury yield could end the year at 1.8%, but of course, during the initial periods of low visibility of quantitative tightening and rate hike, the 10-year treasury yields can shoot up to 2%. Coming to investment grade debt, the long duration doesn't make it a very attractive asset class, especially when yields are increasing, so we are underweight. But remember, if 10-year treasury yield crosses 2%, we'll probably cut the current underweight that we have on the safe haven asset classes once we find it interesting. Growth, high yield, and emerging market debt could give some positive total returns, but as we mentioned, low visibility means there is some issue with each and every asset class, and we have to be very very, very confident and very careful when we try to invest in those asset classes. Coming to GCC debt, it should be a good year for the asset class, especially considering the oil prices, which should remain strong. Now, starting our deep dive with investment grade debt. If you look at the left side chart, you can see that last time the OA spreads actually widened by 50 bips. Will that repeat itself? We don't think so. Mostly because the economic growth remains strong and moreover, this balance sheet normalization or quantitative tightening should be anticipated by the investors beforehand, right? Now, are there any opportunities in investment grade debt to get juicier yields? Of course there is. Financial subordinated debt, or as you know, as COCOs and 81 perpetuals should actually give you some good yield. 
But if you want respite from the increasing yields, FRN or floating rate notes are your best friend. Remember, they are issued by very, very strong issuers which have ratings of A or triple B plus. And just look at the way they behaved in the last quantitative cycle on the right side chart. It is a straight line up in terms of total returns. So when every other segment might be giving you negative returns, this segment F, FRN will actually give you positive total returns and will protect your portfolio. Coming to high yield, it's a very, very strong fundamental versus expensive valuation kind of debate there. Now, coming to fundamentals, there are upper end support factors which actually give resilience to the spreads. First of all, there is very high cash balance in the balance sheet of high yield issuers and the record issuance in 2020 and 2021 means the refinancing requirements in the next three years is pretty benign. Look at the right side chart. In each of these years, the refinancing requirements are less than $100 billion. So default rates, there'll be a lead on them and that should drive the spreads. But look at the left side chart. Last time, the valuations were as tight as the current time and they widened by almost 200 bips. That should not happen. But remember, whenever the valuations are expensive and whenever there is uncertainty in the market, the spreads blowout can happen. So we are neutral on the asset class, but we think if the spreads widen to around 475 bips, which is something close to the 80 percentile mark, we'll go overweight on this asset class. Now, coming to emerging market debt, this is the only asset class where we have an overweight. Why? Because we have reasonable valuations here. Look at the right side chart. The leftmost bar belongs to emerging market sovereign. You can see that the red triangle, which indicates the current yield, is very close to the blue circle, which is the median yield. And this, that's why emerging market sovereign actually gives you some kind of good valuation and potential of spreads decreasing. But the last time, if you look at the quantitative tightening at the start in October 2017, the spreads were way low. They were starting around 240 bips. Currently, the spreads are around 300 bips, which are more or less around the 60 percentile mark. That means emerging market debt has been cheaper only 40 percent of the times. So that means valuations are reasonable. But the bugbear of this asset class is long duration. That means it will be vulnerable to yields increasing. So we advise whenever you see 10-year treasury yields going up by 10 or 15 bips, go into this asset class. And don't go all in at the start of the year, but go in tranches. And you should be able to generate total returns, which would be positive. Coming closer home, we prefer high yield to, emerging, to investment grade debt. And why is that? Because oil prices will remain strong and that will cap any blowout in spreads. That means credit risk, credit spreads remain low and tight. But between high yield, if you look at Egypt, Bahrain, and Oman, and have a look at the right side chart, you can see that Oman clearly benefited from this oil price rise as its fiscal performance improved in 2021. Well, Bahrain and Egypt had their own idiosyncratic issues. So starting the year, we do not have a clear cut preference among any of these three entities, but we prefer five to seven year tranche. And we think that both Bahrain and Egypt will continue to perform well this year. Coming to our thematic ideas, we think China local currency government debt is something that should be added to the client portfolios. And we have seen that investor portfolios are more or less missing this particular segment. Why is that? There are two key reactions. One is diversification, and the second is basically the kind of returns that we expect from this asset class. If you look at 2021, it was the only asset class which gave 8% plus returns, which is unheard of. And even this year, in January, it has given 1%. What is driving the returns from this asset class? Obviously, the divergent policies that PBOC has taken compared to Fed. When Fed is on a hawkish trend, PBOC is trying to support the Chinese economy by cutting rates and it should benefit Chinese government bonds. Do not only go about yield. The yield of this asset class may be 2.5%, but remember the duration is only five years as well. So if you look at the total returns this year, this asset class could be one of the other asset class as compared to emerging market debt and high yield to give you total returns. Now look at the right side chart, how it diversifies. Look at December 18 and March 2020 performance of this asset class compared to a broader emerging market debt. While broader emerging market debt spreads actually widened, the China IG debt spreads remain pretty stable. That means if there is any turbulence, 
This will be the asset class that will probably cushion the blow to your portfolios. Coming to our second and last theme, this is a year of ESG. 2021 was an amazing year for ESG, especially you can see that the issuance doubled in volume compared to 2020. Of course, Western Europe stole a march over their peers by contributing almost 60% of the ESG bonds. But remember, emerging market debt is not far behind. In fact, in 2020, we expect ESG issuance from emerging market debt players to cross $300 billion. And we expect MENA region players, especially the sovereigns and the GREs to come into play because most of them are actually building up their ESG frameworks. Of course, there are two things troubles in terms of greenwashing. There is a trouble regarding the greenflation that is there in the markets. But this will go away as and when this segment matures. So what we advise you to add a bit of ESG tint because as institutional investors focus more on more uh, on this asset class, we believe you will realize the greeniums that will come from this asset class. So to summarize, stay invested. Do not fret about the MTM losses that will be there in your portfolios and enjoy the exciting journey. Over to you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Satyajit. Another powerful presentation. Now this year on the Global Outlook 2022, we are delighted to welcome Khatija Hack, who is Emirates MBD's Group Head of Research and Chief Economist. Now with two decades of EMEA macro research on her CV, when Khatija calls it, the wise investor listens. Khatija, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott. The global economy has staged a remarkable recovery from the recession in 2020, with the IMF estimating almost 6% growth in 2021. Now, to a large extent, this was due to the continued fiscal and monetary support that we had from the depth of the pandemic in 2020. However, this year is already looking very different, and the outlook, as Maurice and his team have already explained, is very uncertain. Growth is expected to slow in 2022 as activity normalizes and fiscal and monetary support is gradually withdrawn. At the same time, inflation has accelerated sharply and has remained much higher for longer than most of the central banks had expected. One of the main drivers of inflation over the course of 2021 was higher energy prices, and this is likely to remain elevated for the next few months at least. Supply chain issues are also a problem and they are likely to ease this year, but probably only towards the second half of 2022. And finally, wage inflation in the United States in particular is of concern to the central bank there. So what does this mean for monetary policy? Well, the Fed has become increasingly hawkish. Um, as we've seen data over the last uh, few weeks and even over the last couple of months. Um, this has shown a significant uh, improvement in the labor market in the United States. We've seen uh, much faster job growth than had been expected. And in fact, these charts are already a little bit out of date given the data that we had at the end of last week on the non-farm payrolls for January. We've seen the unemployment rate fall to almost pre-pandemic lows. And as I mentioned, wage growth has been particularly sharp, um, and this is causing some concern about uh, the potential of a wage price spiral in the United States. As a result, we're now expecting the Federal Reserve to raise rates from March. Um, the rate of increase is still um, quite uncertain. Some participants are expecting um, potentially a 50 basis point rate hike in March, um, but I think it's fair to say that we're looking at at least four 25 basis point moves, um, possibly more before the end of this year. In terms of oil markets, which are obviously a big driver for activity in our region, um, we are expecting a much more balanced outlook from a fundamental perspective, notwithstanding the much higher oil prices that we've seen in recent weeks. Um, so those higher oil prices have really been due to um, geopolitical concerns around Russia, Ukraine, and also in the region. However, from a supply demand perspective, the market looks to be much more balanced this year than it was in either 2020 or 2021. On that basis, we are expecting oil prices to average around $70 a barrel in 2022. 
um, which is roughly where it was last year and will certainly be a, a big boost for the region, both in terms of its budgets as well as in terms of supporting uh, oil production as we move into um, 2022. Turning to the GCC then, um, the 2021 recovery was a lot more gradual than we saw in the big economies around the world, including the United States, um, Europe and the UK. And to a large extent, that was due to less direct fiscal stimulus from the governments in this region relative to those other economies. The main reason for that, of course, is that the economic model here is quite different. There is no tax collected when things are going well. And so there's no mechanism to then redistribute those taxes when things are going uh, badly. Um, nevertheless, we have seen a rebound in the region um, in both the oil and the non-oil sectors, um, and we expect that to continue through the course of 2022. Now, high oil prices are going to help governments in the region to reduce their budget deficits quite sharply, um, and that is certainly going to provide a cushion for them to continue to invest in key sectors where they want to see long-term growth. However, we don't expect higher oil revenues in the region to translate into a significant additional fiscal stimulus from governments. Uh, we, in our view, there's been a big shift in the region to recognizing um, that oil revenues cannot be the main driver of growth uh, going forward. And so the governments have really focused on fiscal reform and structural reform to try and in, um, encourage private sector and foreign investment in the region to become a much more important driver for growth going forward. Um, nevertheless, the, the budgets will benefit from higher oil prices and growth will benefit from higher oil production in the region as well. That's not to say there are no challenges facing the region. Clearly, uh, higher interest rates, which will be imported from, uh, from the Fed, and a stronger US dollar are going to be headwinds to the recovery in the non-oil sectors uh, in the GCC. If we look specifically then at the UAE, um, we had a very strong finish to 2021. We saw a sharp rebound in the number of tourists coming into the UAE. Um, we saw domestic demand supported by um, Expo 2020, um, and hospitality and retail were probably the key beneficiaries of that increase in spending towards the end of last year. Now, the survey data that we've seen uh, over 2021 and even into 2022 have confirmed that businesses are enjoying a sharp increase in activity and in new work. Um, but what we haven't seen is that being translated through into faster job creation in the private sector. Now, clearly, there are some sectors which are seeing significant growth in employment. But when we look at the average uh, that's coming through the survey data, um, there doesn't seem to be a very sharp uh, rate of growth in terms of hiring. And I think to a large extent, that reflects businesses' continued focus on cost constraints. Um, they have faced rising input costs over the course of last year, as have most uh, businesses around the world. Input costs have gone up, transport costs have gone up. But in the UAE, there's not been the same ability to pass those higher costs on to consumers. And as a result, margins have been under pressure and businesses, again, remain very much uh, cost focused. Um, looking ahead, we do expect um, Expo 2020 to support activity in the, the first quarter of this year. But from our perspective, the benefits, the real benefits of Expo have already been achieved in terms of the infrastructure and the investment that's happened in the UAE over the last decade, which then sets up a platform for growth over the coming decade. We expect non-oil sector growth of at least 4% in the UAE this year, but headline GDP growth is probably going to be much higher at around 4.6%. Um, and that's really reflecting uh, an increase in the UAE's oil production this year um, as OPEC Plus continues to bring more oil to the market. Just touching very quickly on the real estate sector in Dubai, which I know is of great interest to many of you. Um, we've seen, as I'm sure you are aware, a very sharp rebound both in um, residential uh, sales prices as well as the, the rents in Dubai in particular. Um, now, this was something of a surprise given that um, the economy was under such a huge amount of pressure in 2020. We had a, a number of people 
um, leaving. And so we had expected demand to be relatively soft. But I think one of the, the benefits um, of Dubai's and the UAE's fantastic management of the COVID pandemic has been that it's made the UAE a destination for uh, foreigners to come and live and work while their own countries have been in lockdown and suffering from significant increases in the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. So we've had an increase in the number of foreign investment. Um, we've also had a change in the demand from domestic consumers for uh, much larger units because of working from home and schooling from home. And that has uh, pushed up the demand for villas in particular at a time when the supply of those larger units has been constrained. So we've really seen the biggest increase in prices in the villa segment of the market. We are seeing apartments um, catching up. Um, but again, it tends to be the larger units which are showing the faster uh, price growth uh, relative to, to the smaller units. Um, going forward though, you know, the question is whether the rates of growth that we've seen in 2021 can be sustained. Um, in our view, uh, that's less likely to be the case given that interest rates are rising um, and that the rest of the world is reopening and normalizing as well. So the relative benefit of being based in Dubai, I think, um, is perhaps a little bit less than it was in 2021, when you still had many economies around the world with quite tight and severe restrictions. Um, so we think going forward, uh, we will see a moderation in terms of uh, further growth in, in residential real estate, particularly as more supply is coming onto the market at the time that demand is expected to soften. Now, touching finally on Saudi Arabia, um, obviously a very important driver for the region. It is, in fact, the biggest economy in the region. Um, and when Saudi Arabia tends to do well economically, so does the rest of the GCC. We did see a stronger than expected recovery in the Saudi non-oil sectors in 2021. Um, we had expected the higher VAT rates and higher taxes and relatively tight fiscal policy to result in a, in a relatively uh, slow rate of rebound in terms of non-oil sector growth. That was not the case. Um, and in fact, uh, we're expecting that to continue this year as well. Um, as we mentioned before, higher oil prices and increased oil production means that budgets are going to look a lot healthier this year. We're expecting the Saudi budget to actually post a surplus um, in 2022 for the first time in over a decade. Now, at the same time, the government has remained quite disciplined in terms of its fiscal policy, even though it's expected to get a lot more oil revenue. They've actually reduced their budget spending in the 2022 budget. Um, but what they have done and what they will continue to do, we think, is use the public investment fund to continue to drive domestic investment in the kingdom in the key sectors that we are looking at, particularly leisure and hospitality, um, infrastructure, um, and that I think is going to underpin quite solid growth in the Saudi non-oil sector in 2022, even though uh, the government is going to be quite careful in terms of its spending. Um, so overall, then, a very optimistic uh, picture, I think, for the region relative to the rest of the year. Although, again, I will stress that there is quite low visibility, uncertainty is high, there are risks, uh, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the coming months in the form of uh, potentially a new variant of the coronavirus, which may be more resistant to vaccine protection, um, and that then changes the dynamics uh, once again. But for the time being, I think it's safe to say uh, we are in an environment of volatility, um, there's going to be changes in fiscal and monetary policy. Um, it's going to drag down growth. But in our region, um, increased oil production will be a big boost to the overall levels of activity and liquidity in this region. Thank you, Khadija. Genuinely fascinating. And remember, how often do you get to ask people this smart a question. So get your questions submitted in the live Q&A box. And now finally, the world is a tumultuous place, but we now turn to the calmest of men, the Zen-like Giorgio Borelli, Emirates MBD's Head of Asset Allocation and Quantitative Strategies. Believe me, that's not easy to say. And he will give us his big picture to keep us all a sense of perspective. Giorgio, it's over to you. 
Thank you, Scott. Today I'll be talking about the next decade. And today's most important question is, what will financial markets be like in the next decade? How should you adjust your portfolios? Because we see a big paradigm shift ahead. Big changes are already in the making. Two conclusions for you. Equity and bond returns will not be that appealing in the next decade. And for wealth creation, you'll have to rely more on income generating strategies, alternative strategies, as well as on a more dynamic investing approach for your portfolios. Uh, well, so a paradigm shift is coming. Let's see what it is going to be like. Um, the 2010s in the slide represent the past, the 2020s the future, and the impact of the changes we see are highlighted in yellow. So the past was about inequality, and today it is more about redistribution policies. It was about monetary policy, and today fiscal policy is gaining dominance. It was about globalization, and today it's more about deglobalization and protectionism. The three big changes we think will drive a drastic change in the growth inflation trade-off. And as the growth inflation profile of the business cycle changes, so should your asset allocation, the asset mix in your portfolio. Well, in the past, it was about credit, the search for yield and growth. They were all the rage, the growth investment style. And nowadays, it's more about commodities outperforming, the need for inflation protection, and the shift towards value investing. In the past, it was about passive and long only. They were great. But we think that from now on, active and absolute return will be working even better. And if you want to gain even more flexibility, then throw in private assets as well on top of liquid assets. All of this suggests that you should have less traditional assets in your portfolio, more alternatives, and your investment process should be driven by a strong tactical asset allocation process. So, Let's see what the new portfolio should look like, and let's start from the traditional portfolio. A simplified version of the traditional portfolio is the 60% equity and 40% bond portfolio. For, sim for simplicity, we'll be looking only into US assets and since the 60s. So the traditional portfolio did really serve as well when there was the so-called Goldilocks backdrop when inflation and growth were neither too high nor too low, neither too hot nor too cold. But outside of that macroeconomic backdrop, when inflation was really high, another portfolio served as well. And when there was asset bubbles, so growth deteriorated at the end of last century and at the beginning of this century, then another portfolio served as well. A simplified version of that portfolio is called the permanent portfolio. There is always traditional asset classes in that portfolio, bonds a stock, but in a lower proportion. There is gold, which represents non-traditional asset classes, and cash, which represents the need for more degrees of freedom to navigate more challenging markets. So the permanent portfolio is better suited for higher inflation and volatility, and as a different decade, more volatile decade approaches, we think that you should gradually shift from the old to the new portfolio. And a bit of number crunches, crunching should bring the point home. Our forecast for US equities, the annual forecast for the next 10 years average, is slightly more than 4%. Likewise, the expected return for uh, the US 10-year Treasury note, in our view, is slightly below 2%. So overall, the 60-40 portfolio in the United States should not return much more than, not much more than 3%. But this is not really appealing. But if you subtract from that inflation, which we estimate between 2.5 and 3%, then you would be getting a real return close to zero, not really appealing at all. So why such these small returns ahead? simply because starting valuations are high and valuations do matter for longer-term wealth creation. 
Yeah, so what should we doing to get better returns in the next decade? When there is doubts and uncertainty about returns, well, you should be looking into income generating strategies. That's why in our template, on the slide, we have highlighted hybrids in orange. Hybrids are income generating assets and they share some of the features of safe bonds and equities. And they sit between bonds and equities in the template. I mean, corporate investment grade and high yielding bonds, uh, emerging market debt, global rates, we could throw in also convertibles and preferreds if you want. Their feature is that their sharp ratio in relative terms is appealing, being the sharp ratio of the risk adjusted return, the ratio of expected return to expected volatility. And if you look in the column before the sharp ratio column, you can see the returns we expect for each asset class, the absolute level of return for the, de for the decade ahead, the annualized return, and that number is relatively appealing for hybrid assets as compared to safe bonds as well as compared to equities. So we have estimated that if in the 60-40 portfolio you can comp even completely replace the 40% of treasuries with hybrid assets, you can get up to slightly more than 50% of additional return on average annually. That's already something but maybe not enough. If you want to do more, please bear in mind that there is ahead a more challenging and volatile decade. Sure, you should be looking into absolute return strategies, that is hedge funds, to make your portfolios less directional, less dependent on market direction, so that you can decrease the portfolio volatility and produce better risk adjusted return. If you want to achieve this, then yes, hedge funds are the answer. And you can, as you can see on the slide, the relative performance of absolute return strategies tend to improve the blue line as equity volatility, the yellow line, increases. So you want to mitigate the risk of heavier losses, please consider hedge funds for your portfolios. And last but not least, if you want to increase your degrees of freedom, then please consider a more flexible asset allocation process, which would mean adjusting your asset weights as market conditions change. In, in the slide, you can see two benchmarks. The orange line, which is the 60-40 traditional portfolio, the light blue line, which is a multi-asset equal weight benchmark made out of nine different asset classes. And then you can see the dark blue line, which is a dynamically managed portfolio, which we have built by selecting each month four of the best um, nine asset classes in the multi-asset portfolio. So what, what this slide should bring home is that tactical portfolio management should be adding to returns if driven by a robust asset allocation process. Well, to conclude, uh, the main message of this presentation is that liquid assets won't be producing those appealing returns for the next decade, so you might as well consider throwing in the mix private assets, private equity, private credit, and non-listed real estate. We are working on that for you as well. So in the end, a really different decade ahead requires a different portfolio. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Giorgio, and thank you again to all of the CIO office team. And thank you to you, the audience, for staying tuned. Now, bear with us. You've still got a little bit of time to get a question in, and then we'll be back with the live Q&A. And I believe we are now back for the live Q&A. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. I tell you what, some of the most engagement I've ever seen on a webinar, um, lots of questions for our panelists. Let me just reintroduce them all for you uh, one more time. Welcome back to Emirates MBD's Chief Investment Officer, Maurice Gravier, Anita Gupta, the Head of Equity Strategy, 
Satya Jit Singh, the head of fixed income strategy for Emirates MBD. And of course, you just saw him a moment ago, Giorgio Borelli, Emirates MBD's head of asset allocation and quantitative strategies, which still remains difficult to say. Thank you all, great presentation, lots and lots of questions coming in. So I'm gonna ask you all to keep your questions brief and to the audience, we will try and answer as many as we can for you. Um, First question of housekeeping. Uh, a lot of you have asked whether or not this, this session is being recorded and will be available for playback. Yes, it will be, I'm delighted to say. And if you stay tuned to Emirates MBD's channel, such as their websites and their YouTube channel, you will see that there shortly. So again, thank you. Right, now, uh, inflation, inflation, inflation seems to have dominated some of the questions. So I'm gonna ask the first one, and Maurice, I hope you're ready for this. Uh, Roni Rashad, and please, if I pronounce your name wrong, I'm really sorry. Um, he asked the question, with the huge increase in inflation, consumers have reduced purchasing power. Will this hit growth even if companies try to pass on costs and maintain margins? Will we see consumer demand reduce? Good question to kick off the debate. Yeah, it's an excellent question and, uh, and uh, very happy to see so many people connected and, and so many questions we haven't seen the highest number of questions ever. So I like this because it means low visibility, <laughs> maybe the same. Inflation, uh, well, uh, it's an excellent question because actually uh, the key thing that makes us hopeful is that as this gentleman rightly said, inflation is currently driven by demand, which means that if we had a kind of a slowdown, a marked slowdown in macroeconomy, we believe that the inflation problem would disappear. Now, uh, with regards to the precise question, what about uh, purchasing power and the impact on demand? First, uh, inflation is not everywhere. And it's interesting to know that, yes, it's 7% in the US, 40, 40 years uh, record. It's around 5% in the UK. Uh, in China, consumer price index is up less than 2%. In the UAE, it's 2.5%. So what I want to say is that it's not this high inflation everywhere. And there are reasons which explain, especially energies in some places, and we believe it will abate. In the US, where it is the most important, because in the US you have the Fed and you have all this, um, all this mechanism put in place, um, what is important is that first, uh, consumers' pockets are full. The level of savings is currently extremely high after the magic money and everything. Second, employment is really improving. We are quite at the, the same level as before the pandemic in terms of unemployment with rising wages. So this sustains a bit of inflation, but this offsets the negative impact on purchasing power. So we really believe that demand will remain strong because the recovery still has legs. And we believe that inflation could normalize. We could be wrong, by the way. Uh, we talk about low visibility. It's not just to, uh, the, to it's not just um, a headline, you know. We could be wrong on this one. We believe that not because the structural drivers against inflation are here. And we believe that anyway, interest rates will be capped because no, you know, central banks, they don't like inflation, no doubt. But what they don't want is a financial crisis. And given the level of debt that we have in the system, especially from sovereign and including the US, by the way, uh, you cannot afford to have in long term interest rates being too high and and devastating the public finance. I hope it uh, answers. <laughs> the great thing about Maurice is when he gives you a brief answer, there's always a lot of information in there. Um, I'm going to stay with inflation. And Giorgio, I'm going to tag you in here. Uh, one, for the, uh, one for you here. As inflation moves up and growth moderates to 4%, which is yet commendable, what is your view of commodities, precious metals and others? All right. Thank you, Scott. Well, um, of course, inflation is, uh, sorry, commodities are the root cause of inflation, right? It's a rising commodity markets driving prices higher. We should wonder whether this cycle in commodities is structural or is going to be uh, is going to have a shorter duration. Well, it seems that according to some studies, this uh, this cycle in commodities is structural. So someone called it um, as early as a couple of years ago, and still we see commodities rising. According to the indices you look at, commodities are decade highs or anyway, at least multi-year highs. And uh, we have two drivers of commodities being structurally higher. Well, first of all, we have market evidence. We have never had a higher number 
of commodity markets in backwardation. Backwardation is a very technical term, which means that the market is tight. So if you if you look at the, this little thing called backwardation and you count the number the number of markets, well, it's never been that uh, such a high number of commodity markets is so tight as far back as data goes. So again, structural reasons uh, on the supply side, uh, at both and on demand side. On the, on, on the supply side, we know there is uh, supply chain issues. In the end, these will unclog, so we should not focus too much on supply chain issues that uh, by definitions, however seemingly persistent, should, be, should, should in the end to be transitory, right? Uh, we cannot have uh, we cannot have a, a tight system on the supply side forever. It would mean we wouldn't be able to address supply side issues. So this supply side issue will be addressed. Uh, what is more structural is the demand side because there has been a change in government policies. For instance, the rush towards a greener economy uh, requires strong investments and strong investments, although are towards a push for a green economy actually are brown investments, meaning <laughs> we are trying to move away from brown to green and going towards green, but actually the investments are brown, meaning that imply a lot of involvement of the old economy companies. If you have to build infrastructure for the green economy, then you, you, you need metals and all kinds of sort and the involvement of mining company, you, you, you need the involvement of, of people who know how to manage and produce and deliver basic resources. So this, this is a long-term issue. And we already seen that a rush, um, a not well-managed rush to a green economy has caused an energy crunch in Europe. And that could just be a sort of alarm bell for what could happen in other commodities. And actually that, there is a record number of markets which are tight, or as I said, in backwardation, is another, I mean, is another sign of the times. Anyway, it would be a long topic, but cutting a long Indeed, break. and you're, you're hogging the limelight, Giorgio. Understandable. Um, and thank you for a very comprehensive question, uh, answer to the question. And Nita, I'm going to bring you in next, actually, give you all a, an opportunity to answer some of our uh, questions coming in. Uh, a really interesting one about the electric car sectors. China versus the USA. Is it too hot? And how about NEO? Okay, so uh, uh, electric vehicles is one of our top uh, thematic picks. It's been for the last three years, continues to be. And uh, China versus the US. Now, China actually has the highest penetration of electric vehicles today. It also has a high growth, and that's in keeping with China's uh, you know, race to net zero. Uh, companies like Neo Xping are now coming out with models. Neo has three models which are on the cards for 2022. Neo's margins are strong. So it's not China versus the US because companies such as Tesla have market share in China. And similarly, you're going to have Chinese automakers who will have market share in the US. You also have a great number of European automakers who are in this race. China is an extremely important market for global automakers. So we are uh, we are aware that yes, Tesla is a, has the first mover advantage, but today the electric vehicles that would have the uh, longest range, the best batteries in terms of replacements, and also are able to roll out low uh, cost models, you know, where it's affordable for the consumer are the ones that would do well. Brilliant. Now, Super Satyash Singh, we're going to give you a question here. This is a long question. Try and give it a short answer if you possibly can. Um, if interest rates are raised by the Fed and the ECB, bonds will drop in value and stock market will react negatively. Um, that is likely both bonds and equity values will decline, which means a bigger hit on investments. What would you be doing to protect and bring back value that there was in 2021? Absolutely. As uh, Giorgio mentioned, both in the next decade, both bonds and equity returns are going to be low. But you have to understand about asset allocation, right? There's not a single asset class that can actually give you all the returns. Similarly, there is not a single asset class that you can avoid. I'll just take an example, the January drawdown that happened in S&P 500 and in NASDAQ, when NASDAQ was down almost 15%. 
bond prices, most of the short duration bonds were down by two to three percentage points. So that actually cushions the blow to the portfolios, as I had mentioned. What is more important is to follow a disciplined asset allocation where you have some allocation for equities, some for bonds, some for real estate, hedge funds, gold and cash. So that way your portfolio is well balanced. And even if any risky segment of the market falls down by you know 10, 15 percent, your portfolio may not be down by that much. So we have seen bonds actually cushioning that. Plus going ahead, the way bond investment has actually changed from the last five years. Last five years, we saw yields going down, rates going down. So bonds were almost behaving like equities going up in value. But that's not what fixed income is about. Fixed income is about holding onto a bond almost to maturity, generating the income and locking the yield. And that's how it's going to be. We are going to go back to the traditional ways of fixed income investing, where you invest in a bond, hold it till maturity, and you gain the yield. That's how you protect your portfolios. And that's how you invest in bonds. Thank you, Satya. We've got so many questions on so many topics. So I'm going to jump about some of the topics because I want it, this to be a diverse selection of questions. Uh, I'm going to jump back to you, Maurice, and a really good question. Do you see cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin becoming currencies used in the real economy soon and recognized by some federal banks? What would be the impact on the value of those currencies? Very interesting question. Yeah, very interesting question. And um, uh, well, there is one currently, El Salvador has recognized uh, Bitcoin as um, as an official currency. It's the only one, and it's interesting to see that the IMF is really not happy about that, and there is lots of pressure to avoid that. Um, well, first, cryptocurrencies are already used for many things. It's not in the real world, as you say, it's in the parallel world, which is probably the, the, the future of the metaverse. People don't buy NFTs with uh, fiat currencies and they don't invest in cryptocurrencies with fiat currencies. They go through stablecoin, this kind of thing. Uh, frankly, I think that governments and central banks don't like it at all. And the reason why they want to issue their own digital, uh, the, their own digital currencies, which are cryptocurrencies, is not for decentralization, which is the purpose of the Bitcoin and Ethereum and everything. It's for control. So it, it's absolutely different. And... Uh, I think it will take really a long time to see an official recognition. What we see currently is like uh, some government saying, OK, that's fine. You can make profits, you can play on crypto. But at the end, when you come back to the system, you will have to pay a tax. And that's probably something that we will see. It's a kind of um, uh, quasi uh, recognition saying, yes, it exists. You can do it, but don't forget to pay your taxes when you come back in the system. Once it's officially recognized, there is no tax, nothing. It's just currency. So uh, no doubt. Cryptocurrencies and crypto assets and the blockchain and the Web3, they are here for long, but being part of the official system, it's, it would take a long time. I think it's more a coexistence than, um, than a merger. Brilliant. I, I find this fascinating and, and so many great questions from the audience. Anita, I'm going to throw one um, to you. It's very topical right here in the UEE. What do you see as the impact of the, the new corporate tax um, on UE companies and IPOs here? Yeah, so Scott, so what we're seeing is a great number of IPOs which are coming into the market. Of course, Abu Dhabi ports listed just uh, yesterday, we are seeing upside there. Uh, companies in the UE which are listed are largely profitable with growing earnings 20% uh, for this year and the next year. So they can very definitely, you know, bear the 9% corporate tax. It's not going to be a game changer in terms of the market movement. And this is also in keeping with global best practices. So uh, we don't see an impact on either even foreign investments, uh, even uh, companies which are willing to, you know, wanting to come in and set up operations here. We think it's actually a positive uh, for the economy. Great. Um, and I'm going to come back to you, Maurice, as well, because there's a question that's also quite uh, prevalent on people's minds. And there's been three or four different questions around it about the real estate market in the media sector. And what's your view of that? Mm -hmm. um, well, interestingly, maybe you would remember that we were we were very, very uh, bullish on the real estate market in the MENA sector just a year ago, just by comparing the prices between uh, Dubai and Singapore, this kind of thing. We are not on Singapore's prices yet, but it has sharply risen, mostly villas. It was part of, um, of Katija's presentation. And, um, and looking forward, we believe that 
um, you know, part of it was uh, some kind of bargain hunting, which was absolutely, uh, absolutely right. Part of it is here to stay because, um, as we all know, in the UAE, after the fantastic management of the crisis, many people from the world are realizing that it's not just a place to spend holidays or, or to, uh, to spend two years, but it's a place to live uh, forever. And, uh, and so we have some of this. We expect moderation looking ahead, but certainly not a, a crash and the ups and downs. Actually, last year was probably a correction or, or a correction of an excess um, drawdown that lasted for some years. And we are probably uh, looking to some moderate rise looking forward. Time is against us. I'm going to throw a question out to the floor, and I think it's kind of like fastest finger first. Who wants it? A uh, great question. The SP 500 is on a continuous rise. Do you see any foundation for this increase, or do you foresee correction in the short term? And someone else did ask also, do we see a bear market coming? Um, whoever wants that, put your hand up and get in there. Okay, I can so start, and then uh, no, it's for you, Anita. Go. Yeah, first. There was a great foundation to the rise. It was earnings growth plus very low interest rates, uh, which justify high multiples. So you have higher multiples on higher earnings. You have this. Do we expect a correction? Corrections happen. Up to you, Anita. Okay. So, yes, I do see a few more corrections coming in. Typically, the S&P 500 corrects at least once or twice by 5 or 10%. We're going to see a couple more corrections, but our year end fair value is at 49.50 on a very simplistic 21 times multiple and 10% earnings growth. Yeah, and to see a bear market, we would have to have either a recession, in which case we're really in trouble, uh, to see a crash in bonds, interest rates overshooting, and we don't think that central banks would, we would let this happen because of the levels of debt. Uh, yeah, but... Okay. Uh, also, uh, a question that's uh, very sort of prevalent in this region, and we're going to, unfortunately, we're going to have to make this the last question because time is just against us. But, uh, and again, fastest finger first. I like to see who's going. Perhaps, Maurice, um, do we expect the strong rally? In, ooh, hang on, another question just dropped in. Do we see the strong rally in oil stocks, which we saw in 2021, to continue in view of the outlook on oil? And I can see Maurice has already. I did that. <laughs> yes. Which way? Oh, yeah. so, yes. Actually, yes, I, we do, I do expect the uh, energy uh, stock rally to continue. Very simplistically, oil prices are higher. Uh, these companies are highly profitable today. There is major buybacks being announced, including from BP. Shell also has a green strategy. So in a nutshell, yes, we do expect the rally to continue into 2022. Okay, I said that was going to be the last question, but I will sneak that one last question in that just dropped in about gold price and where we see gold as an asset. Okay, Giorgio, it's for you. Yes, thank you. Our fair value for gold currently is 1700 because we, th we think that uh, the central bank is far from being done with the monetary tightening as it just, just started. And usually when there is tightening gold, like it's, it's, it's not a good time for gold. It, I must also, so 1700 would be our fair value uh, about, I think, 6% below the current, uh, the current market price. It's also true that gold currently is not uh, reacting very much to this uh, outlook for, for, for tighter conditions. Maybe the market is discounting a much shallow, at least gold investors are discounting a much shallower tightening cycle ahead. They might think that the Fed will get stuck halfway. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I mean, I think we can see by the level of the questions and the diverse nature of the questions, Maurice, that that, you know, a year of, you know, uh, sort of uncertainty in this year of low visibility that you talk about is clearly there. There's lots of questions. Do you want to wrap it up um, with one last thought on you know, any of those questions we've seen coming in? Ah, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, there are so many questions. Um, well, the, the, the key thing is that this year is going to be tactical. We are prepared for the ups and downs that we will see. We may be wrong on something. The reality could be worse than, than, than what we expect. It's possible. But still, keep in mind that looking forward, investment is for the medium to long term. None of our allocation is made for a year and certainly not for a month. And they are built, they are bulletproof to avoid any, uh, to, 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 yeah, to avoid capital losses over three, five and seven years. And please bear with us. That's the, the right horizon to look at. 
So uh, it just remains on me to bring this to a, a close. Thank you to everyone that's tuned in today. Um, one of the most highly engaged webinars we uh, I've been you know, had the pleasure of engaging with. So thank you for all your questions. Thank you for the presentation uh, to the team, Maurice, Giorgio, Anita, Satya. Thank you very much. I'm Scott Armstrong. I'm the editor in chief of Ravi Business, and I really hope you enjoyed this presentation and live webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.